then you know, the environment was cleaned up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. Adele with Social Impact Consulting. Hello everyone. My name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects, which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. One. Thank you for watching the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Are you interested in sponsoring Dev Sector Series? Please call me at 234 703 As we spread your brand, we spread around the world. And as we do that, we are all changing the world. So let's work together. Contact me so that we can maximize social impact. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello everyone, this is Efwa with Social Impact Consulting. Thank you for watching this episode of the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series, okay? So we are so excited to have you here. Um, please just let us know where you are hailing from, whether it be Nigeria, other parts of Africa, Europe, America. Well, America, the time, the time difference. But if you're if you're if you're logging from there or suffering jet lag, you let us know, okay? So we are having an exciting lineup today. Please make sure you like and share this broadcast so that we reach more people, okay? Follow and connect with me on all my social media handle handles on all things development sector all things organizational development, all things advocacy. So follow my social media handles for future updates, okay? We have Development Sector Series, which is hashtag Dev Sector Series, every Wednesday at 12 noon, okay? So if you have any questions about the discussion in this particular program, please be so kind and include it in the comment section so that we can engage in an interactive discussion. Today, we're going to be having discussions about digital rights and liberties in the African continent. Our guest today is a very special one. From when I started Dev Sector Series, I knew I was going to be having conversations with him. I have watched him advocate for digital rights, digital freedom, digital privacy in Nigeria, coming up with the infrastructure needed to just make sure that the digital environment is conducive for us in Nigeria and Africa. Our guest today, who is Benga Sheson, he is the Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria, a social enterprise that connects underserved people and groups with ICT-enabled opportunities. He's a multi-award winning development practitioner that has been on the frontiers of digital rights and freedom in the African continent. I've known Benga since my tenure at Junior Achievement Nigeria because he's a JAN ambassador. They, you know, they are change makers in which their work speak for them. They just, you know, they just work in the trenches and, you know, they don't do a lot of talking, but they do a lot of work walking. So Benga Chesson is one of them. There are not many like that. You know, when I think of Sheon, when I think of Benga, those are the types of people that I, I, I'm talking about. So I'm going to go over his video bio before introducing him. We're having a few uh, technical difficulties at the time, but he will be on as soon as possible. You know how it is in Nigeria and Africa with our network, but we are 
who are getting there. So I will play his video bio. You guys can also give me a shout out where you're from, where you're um, healing from, and maybe why you like the development sector series as we wait for our very special guest. Okay. So, um, oh, he's here actually. So I'm going to play his video bio and then we will see him shortly. Okay. is the executive director of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria, a social enterprise that connects underserved people groups with ICT-enabled opportunities. PIN's projects include ajegunle.org, a capacity development initiative that connects the community's youth with training, internships, and mentorship opportunities, and Miss PIN, the social campaign that is tackling cybercrime issues in Nigeria. His consulting experience includes assignments completed for numerous institutions, including Microsoft, Harvard University, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Freedom House, Respublica, Computer Aid International, Henrich Boll Foundation, and the International Telecommunications Union and the British Council. Benga has consulted and presented papers in over 30 countries. A member of the United Nations Committee of E-Leaders on Youth and ICT, he is a Crans Montana Forum Fellow, Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellow, Ashaka Fellow, Our Common Future Fellow, and Quartz Fellow. Benga was Nigeria's first Information Technology Youth Ambassador and served as the Vice Chair of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa's African Technical Advisory Committee. In 2006, he was appointed as the youngest member of the Nigerian Presidential Task Force on the restructuring of the Nigerian information technology and telecommunications sector. He was appointed a member of the Presidential Committee on Roadmap for the Achievement of Accelerated Universal Broadband Infrastructure Services Provision in August 2012. His book, In My Own Words, an annotated autobiographical collection of essays was published by Imprimata in September 2009. It has been profiled as a global award-winning icon of ICT in Nigeria, and he keeps a personal website at www.bengasheson.com. Originally trained as an electronic and electrical engineer, at Obafemi Awolowo University, Benga completed executive education programs at Lagos Business School, New York Group for Technology Transfer, Oxford University, Harvard University, Stanford University, Santa Clara University, and the University of the Pacific. Allow me to introduce to some and present to others Benga Sheson, the executive director of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria. Hello, Benga, how are you? <laughs> I just, um, you know, I just got a note that um, you are now Paradigm Initiative because you have, you're now a Pan-African organization. Well done, this is exciting. <laughs> okay, let me... Oh, you were, you were on mute a few minutes, a few seconds ago. So you're now Paradigm Initiative Africa. Yay, this is so exciting. So you're a pan-African organization because the work you're doing, I mean, it's not just for Nigeria, it's for the entire continent. You've been doing great work, you and your team. So I'm extremely, extremely excited about that. <laughs> okay, Okay. <laughs> I keep, I keep, okay. So, um, thank you so much. You know, you know, I've just been watching you. You know, when I was at Jan, I'm like, man, you know, you being a Jan ambassador and, 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 and really you've always been a youth advocate. This is not something that, this is not work for you. This is just life, you know, in terms of what you do with, with young people and really leveraging the, the human capital in the entire continent. So again, well done. I'm just, when you just said Africa, I'm like, oh my goodness, I've, 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 I've missed out on quite a bit because I mean, I've, I've just 
um, you know, been watching your advocacy work on digital rights and digital freedom, you know, and, 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 and the work that you've been doing again, being a well done, well done. And it's, it's, it's people like this, that the work is bigger than you. And, and it's, it, I'm just, I'm just amazed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, and uh, I and, and there was a time I think it was a, a project we did for Intel that uh, you know it was a, it was a while back that um, they actually had to beg you, beg you and your team to take on the project. They were like, and this is what uh, you know I do institutional strengthening for NGOs, and I said this is the way you want to be as an organization. Where donors will just be begging, please. I know you are busy. Just do this for do this for us. So well done, well done. Well yeah, done. I, mean, I can go on and on. <laughs> the partnership. So uh, I think it's win-win. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well done. So um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna get right to it. So um, so individually because you started doing this institutionally and regionally as a continent. But individually, what would you consider as digital freedom? I mean, I think freedom generally uh, refers mm. to you. I mean, things you want to, of course, within the ambit of law, uh, to, be able to be able to do the things you want to do uh, or mm -hmm. when you put them, mm -hmm. uh, your platform of choice. Uh, so the same thing for digital freedom is maybe to do mm -hmm. what you want to do online, mm -hmm. when you want to do it, how you want to do it uh, using mm -hmm. your platform of choice. So there yeah. are no restrictions like, oh, mm -hmm. use this one, don't use this one. You know, mm -hmm. there's no reason because there's a power cord or because there is a, you know, mm -hmm. there's a internet access that is not mm -hmm. as, you know, uh, good as B and, and, and things like that. So digital freedom is the ability to do what you need to do, when you need to do it, and on your platform mm -hmm. of choice to of okay. course, or your preferred aim. Okay, okay that is that is really really something so it's you know so as an individual digital freedom is um being able to do what you need to do with whatever platform you choose you know without having any form of backlash as a result uh, uh, uh um that is that is a really uh a concise definition um so i'm gonna go on to the next question so um You've been working on, you've been advocating for digital rights for a while. This is, this is not, uh, this is not anything new for you. So what is, what is the infringement of digital rights as we know it? Okay. So uh, as with the infringement of rights generally, uh, mm -hmm. the, when a, a state, when this state or an institution then decides that what should be a right for you Mm -hmm. is no longer a right because they want to deny you that opportunity. Then that's, that's an infringement. It could be the state, it could be an individual, it could be a corporation, it could be an institution. Uh, let me give a few examples. So I have data privacy rights. I have a right to own my data and for it not to be used by anyone without notifying me. Now, if someone then take that data, let's say I go to a hospital and I give them my name, uh, my gender, my address, my home address. And then a few days later, somebody comes to knock on my door and says, hi, Binga, uh, I'd like to sell you this life-saving product. Now, that's a problem. Because when I went to the hospital, I said to them, this is my address. So that for any reason, let's say I get back home and I have problems uh, and they need to reach me, they will know where to come to. But if the hospital... Uh, now sells that data to someone else who then comes to sell me, say, you know, all these uh, products, like this will save you from everything and anything and things like that. That's an infringement on my data rights. And it's the same thing when it comes to my data online. If I give you my data and I say, that, okay, you're the government, right? The data, because I want to vote in elections. And then the data gets lost or someone then Gets, gets access to it and then use that information to either sell me something or to use that information against me, that's an infringement on my data privacy mm -hmm. rights. So it's the same mm -hmm. thing with every 
a digital right. Uh, either it's my freedom of expression or my freedom to associate mm -hmm. online or my freedom to own and use my data. When there is, you know, a move or an action that limits my ability to perform that right or to enjoy that right, now that is then an infringement uh, on that right. And a perfect example in Nigeria at the moment is the inability for me to tweet. Uh, so my platform of choice is Twitter for some things, right? And when I want to share information on Twitter, all I need to do is to go to that platform, tweet, and then it goes. But now that the government says that platform is suspended, that is an infringement on my right. Of course, there's a whole lot of conversation uh, around that, but that is also a very good example of an infringement of, of digital rights. Okay, um, I think we may be disconnected from each other. Oh, um, I think if what dropped off, um, okay, I'll just I'll just go ahead and and, and describe, uh, you know, answer the second question so that when she comes back, we can then convert, you know, continue the conversation. And, and as I was saying, I was giving the example of how there can be an infringement of digital rights. Uh, the other example that is beginning to get popular on the continent uh, of Africa in particular is that of internet access, where, you know, for some reason, uh, some people, governments say, you know, we have elections or students writing exams or whatever the excuses. Uh, we don't want people to have access to the internet at this time because we think they will share information on the internet. We don't want them to share. And then they shut down the internet. Now, when the internet is shut down, it means that, yes, you may actually have a legitimate fear. A legitimate fear that, oh, there's some bad news in the internet, but it doesn't give you, you know, that right to shut it down for everyone else. Because when you do that, it means that someone who is using it for health reasons is unable to use it. It means someone is, who is using it for educational reasons is unable to use it. It means somebody who is using it for recreational reasons, for you know shopping, for business reasons is unable to use it. And that is where the challenge is when it comes to infringing on rights. Because when you infringe on rights uh, in the physical space, you can almost hold the person uh, or you can almost say to the person, okay, uh, this is a restriction, right, uh, to what you're supposed to do. But when it comes to the digital platform, you almost can't isolate people. Uh, when you cut people off from certain services, not only are you denying them their own rights, but you are denying that right also to many other people. Of course, there are cases where, you know, you can limit people's data access and things like that. Uh, but one of the major, major uh, differences between physical and digital is that in digital it also means that unfortunately when you lead when you limit my access when you limit the access of bad people to a platform if you don't do it the right way and using the rule of law and everything then you also limit you know that access for the people who are not in the wrong uh who are literally you know uh in the right uh and unfortunately you, you, you know, you then make them suffer for something that, you know, for a crime that they, they haven't uh, committed. Um, so I don't know if FY is back now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bear with me. You know, these are these are network issues, <laughs> so to speak. Oh, uh, Benga, please, can you unmute yourself? Yes. OK, uh, oh. I, I was actually trying to contact you, you know, offline. Yeah, the, yeah. And, the, the, um, but the I, I tried, was, uh, tried my best to hold the space while you were away. OK, uh, OK. And I, I have some more, uh, you know, context with you know, okay. for, the, for the second question <laughs> yes thank you so much for that i appreciate you uh, uh where <laughs> some of my colleagues are a bit nervous about doing these live streamings because of the 
um, part we can't control, which is our network uh, <laughs> challenges. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so um, I'm going to go to the next um, to the to the next question. Um, so now we've been talking about uh, digital rights. So you, as we know in Nigeria, we've had quite a few issues concerning the civic space. Mm. So how has digital uh, uh, harassment affected the um, the, the uh, oppressed category we are on in the civic space? So um, in Nigeria, digital harassment has meant many things. On one level, it has meant that citizens you know, are not able to express themselves the way they want to. Uh, don't forget that between 1999 and 2021, we've come a long way uh, in our democratic world. Before democracy, that's another matter entirely. Uh, I mean, we had previous republics where people were able to express themselves using physical tools, uh, but then the military came, and then we become, became a, a country where people could not express themselves, where we were saying that is doing the wrong thing means that you are either going to be killed or you are going to be killed. Uh, but thanks to you know democracy in 1999, people began to express themselves, but we still have this unfortunate uh, military uh, tendencies where the Secret Service, for example, uh, have not changed as much. The military too, you know, um, and even the police, you know, everything is a bit militarized. Uh, unfortunately. And so what has happened is you have a case where citizens are not able to express themselves. Uh, at times people look at it, just like shut down. So some people can't tweet because they're scared. I am tweeting, I'm tweeting heavily. I'm tweeting more than I used to tweet when there was a ban on Twitter because, you know, Bengashi, you don't dress in Bengashi or something like this. You know, it's, 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 right? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So it, some it of is, us are still... Tweeting, but not as often as we would like. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, sometimes, know. especially this VPN, it would go on and off. There are those headache, yeah. Now, the, the fact that you have to use a VPN to tweet in Nigeria is a form of restriction. Yeah. And that itself has become, you know, a form of harassment on the emotional state, the emotional being, and the financial uh, state of citizens. Mm -hmm. I mean, your phone. Uh, power lasts less, you know, because, yeah. you know, because you're using VPN, you're using all these things, uh, your data is consumed, you have to spend some more money. So citizens, mm -hmm. that's one. The other is also the fact that because uh, government in itself, the state and its many allies have mm -hmm. also turned the online space into a caustic or a sort of toxic space, yeah. it also means that there are criminals who commit crimes online and they have precedent. They have precedent because if the state that is supposed to protect you is harassing you, then it means those who are harassing you uh, will go scot-free. So you also have a separate level where people are harassed based on their gender or on their opinion. And it also, it then means that if I'm a woman, for example, uh, and I tweet something and then someone says, go and marry or, yeah. Now, honestly, I don't want to continue that conversation because in my head, I mean, look, look at it, see the look on your face. You're wondering, what, how does this happen? I mean, there's some things you say and you're like, how on earth does this have anything to do with marriage? But don't forget, this is a patriarchal society where people that are stupid enough not to have anything to say, the first thing they say in response to a woman is to try to make her look you know, less than she is. And around here, what they believe will make you look less is, oh, you are not married, oh, you don't have yes. a man, oh, you don't have uh, children, or things like that. Mm -hmm. now, unfortunately, in their own small world, they believe that uh, they are trying to get at you, you know, or, or something. But of course, it's a limited uh, mindset, it's a parochial uh, mindset, but it still has its own effect. When you look at the data, mm -hmm. you have less and less women online not because they don't have access, but because they consider the environment so tedious to engage in. It is. It is. Talking to a journalist online, and the journalist says, oh, you're a successful woman. And I see this all the time. You're a successful woman. You've accomplished this. You've accomplished that. Blah, blah, blah. And the next question is, so when are you going to settle down? And the question is, yes. what on earth 
does settling down mean? Uh, you know, so you have all these levels of harassment based on gender, based on sexual orientation, based on opinion, based on political affiliation, and based on various things. Uh, but I think most mm -hmm. of it all is when the person who should protect every one of us, which is the state, then mm -hmm. responsible for harassing people online based on what the, you know what they are literally doing, which is expressing you know their opinion as they should, because democracy is a contest of ideas. Democracy is about mm. feedback. Democracy is about, I don't like what the president is doing. I think he should do it differently. It doesn't mean he's going to do it differently. Mm. Uh, if I don't like mm. him, yeah. it means that next elections, I can, you know, if I have enough political clout, I can make sure I organize for him to be, you know, not to be reelected or for him to lose elections and things like that. But a democracy is yes. about the opportunity for at least two categories of people. Number one, concerned citizens. And number two, mm -hmm. society organizations to express themselves. Yes. Yeah. I have a scenario where citizens and civil society organizations are being harassed uh, every time there is a conversation around an NGO bill uh, in Nigeria to limit uh, the funding of NGOs. You know that, oh, because you are getting money internationally or from people, that's mm -hmm. why they are able to do the things you're doing. But guess what? Civil society, there's a reason why it is called the third sector. Yes. The reason it's called the third sector is because apart from the public sector and the private sector, there has to be a sector that is responsible to watch that the public sector and the private sector are fulfilling the terms of their contract with the people. The contract exactly. with the people is to oversee their security of life and property and to present the services to them. The contract of you know the private sector is to fulfill contracts that they are signed. But clearly, as yes. you know, uh, we've had a more terrible response from the first sector, which is the government. Mm -hmm. in terms of, mm -hmm. There's even a contract in many cases, uh, you know, mm -hmm. between local government residents and their local government chairman. And, and I'm almost certain that many Nigerians don't even know if they have a local government chairman or not. No. Or who the government chairman is. And this is where the third sector comes in as a gap filler as the one who then says so a paradigm initiative for example will then say no this is wrong nigeria you can't shut down twitter so we go to court some nigerians yes. not under some nigerians may think oh, what is their problem they're always going to court but that is the yes. job of the third sector, the third sector yes. knows that the bridge between the first and the second and the citizens is their role to play and unfortunately uh all of the harassment we're seeing by the state uh is affecting how the third sector operates within the city but of course it we is. know that that is always that has always been the intention uh of mm -hmm. the states to the ability of the third sector uh so that that mm -hmm. in quotes dog doesn't bark mm -hmm. and bite too much. <laughs> doesn't 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 bark too loudly you know you are so right especially with regards to the civic space concerning women you've really made a connection that i i hadn't really seen because i think i was doing back in 2017 i had opened a facebook page called transform nigeria encouraging people to vote you know, in the various elections, just kind of, I was funding it myself. I just wanted to create, you know, a citizenry where we are, we, we are all um, being aware, citizen engagement. And then what name did I not hear? I'm a prostitute, I'm getting paid by government. Um, and, and once you keep, you have to really be strong as a woman to even deal with some of the harassment you get for just being an advocate and just uh, going into advocacy. And this also results to, um, you know, a lot of women putting up with physical and emotional abuse in their marriages because they know that in society, they are not seen as worthy if they are not mm. married. And then which is the advantage of the state and the patriarchal society. So it's really, I really didn't make that connection before. And even some of my, uh, my colleagues in the sector you know, a lot of times when I talk to my female colleagues, you know, a lot of them are like, and they are doing such phenomenal work. It's just, okay, let's let's have a conversation. Let's connect. It's a bit much, but I'm pushing through that because it's like, we all need to be engaged, you know, and we and the third sector, and which is why I started Dev Sector Series, Benga, because I saw that disconnect between civil society and the public, so that the public understands that it's because of civil society that we are not Afghanistan. 
no offense. It, it's because of us, because of civil society. If you were not in the trenches advocating for digital rights and digital freedom for citizens, we would even be in a worse state than we are now. So I'm just, so that connection, I, I went to town. I mean, you just, <laughs> you made that connection. <laughs> so. It's a thankless job, but it's one Honestly. we sought to do. It's like, it's like mm -hmm. the doctors in the, in the oath or the lawyers in the oath, mm -hmm. uh, as development experts, we also mm -hmm. uh, you know, do the work. And to be honest, there are some benefits that then come eventually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and mm -hmm. we cannot, as I say to my colleagues who are my friends in, in, in government, mm -hmm. there are perks that come with the office of being in government, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you cannot take the perks and ignore mm -hmm. the work. Uh, so exactly. also, work without, you know, getting some of the perks. And it's the same thing you know, yeah. with the sector. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work, uh, but mm -hmm. the a lot of human also. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you can imagine. Uh, for what it feels like when at the end of the year during a retreat you're discussing with your mm -hmm. colleagues and you're thinking of how much work you've done and how much impact that feeling is mm -hmm. much less yeah i mean you're paid a salary you get you know remuneration by the organization and things like that but there's nothing that compares with you know we were able to reach and connect one two three x thousand x million people with yes. digital and rights opportunities this year and that feeling you know, or it's, 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 it's priceless. But of course, there's a price to pay before you get that feeling. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, and, and well done. So you touched about the Twitter ban in, in, in Nigeria, what has happened. And, and I know that folks like you, Hamzi, Shen, and so many others were, were actually in the forefront, Yemi, so many others of, of, of us in the space really speaking up against what has happened with the Twitter ban. Like, what, what is going on? Are we ever gonna get Twitter open? Like, like is this the start of something more sinister? Wh where are we at? Um, so let me, let, me, let me use a proverb that a, a, you know, a friend taught me many years ago. Mm -hmm. so there's a story of an old man who was considered the wisest in the village in the village and then a young man who wanted to disprove him uh you know came to him and he held a bird in his hand behind him and said to this oh he was an old woman actually not an old man mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. men men. <laughs> you know he went to the old woman and said old woman you are the wisest mm -hmm. of all tell me mm -hmm. there's a bird in my hand is the bird in my hand is it alive or dead now mm -hmm. <laughs> the old woman stood up, took her walking stick, walked closer mm -hmm. to him as if to look mm -hmm. at the bird. The boy moved back. No, don't look at it. Tell me what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the old woman went back and sat down, a graceful mm -hmm. African, and she laughed and said, young man, you're asking me if this bird is alive or dead. Well, I'll tell you. If I tell you that the bird is alive, you will squeeze it and kill it. Hmm. You that the bird is dead, you release it and let it fly just to prove me wrong because that's what you came to do. And then she said, My answer to you is that whatever happens to this bird, either it is alive or dead, the power is in your hands. And mm. the young man left the place thinking to himself, Hmm, wisdom, wisdom. Mm. I think this is exactly what the situation is for advocacy in general and Twitter ban specifically in Nigeria. The future, where we go from here, depends on us. We can sit back and squeeze the bird along with the government and let it die and just accept it as normal. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, all our as they say in Yoruba, or whatever, anywhere, but left it. Oh, they go, move, they say, and they go. Mm -hmm. We move, as we say. Hashtag we move. Or we could decide to let this bird live. And mm -hmm. how to do that? Will be three things number one not keep quiet dear the government at times government doesn't know what they're doing they've tried they don't. don't forget tackling terrorism in nigeria they're trying everything i would commend the military and all that mm -hmm. uh but once in a while you can see that government is even trying i mean they are they are they are trying but they don't know what they are doing they first of all said link your scene. To your, register your sin and we will end terrorism and kidnapping 
you register the sin, nothing happened. They said, link your sin to your name and we'll end terrorism. People linked it, they began to postpone. It doesn't end terrorism. They said, okay, we'll shut down in Zamfara, we'll shut down in this state, we'll shut down in that state. And still, we're, you know, we're seeing some action now, uh, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So it means at times you need to challenge them to think mm -hmm. better and to do better. If you really, the problem that government said they had with the Twitter ban was that, you know, the wrong people use Twitter. Are those people left Twitter now? Or are there yeah. other ways of addressing it? That's why we need to defy. That's why we need to challenge. That's why we need to say no to it anything that we don't agree with the second is not just to speak i mean the first one is sort of okay speak up let it let mm -hmm. it be clear let them keep hearing you mm -hmm. like stop lying to us Muhammad <laughs> Bawari, uh, be the son that you have don't be a disgrace mm -hmm. let them know that they have to do the right thing second is not to just talk but to act and to take action take action by going to court uh, some people said, okay, we're not NGOs, we can't go to court. There is now, thanks to EIE Nigeria, Paradigm Initiative, MRA, Middle East Agenda, and others, and many citizens, there is now a class action lawsuit about this Twitter ban in Nigeria asking mm -hmm. telcos to pay a fine of 5 billion naira. Because it's important that we know that telcos should not just simply cut off access because government said they should do so. Exactly, really, exactly. Because they are scared of their license, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe we also need to create a counter fear, mm -hmm. the fear of losing their customer. You may be mm -hmm. scared of losing your license, but you should also be scared of losing your customers. What the counter fear of losing your customers would then do is it will make you say to those who say you will lose your license that, mm -hmm. well, we don't want to lose the license, but we also don't want to lose our customers. So is there another way we can do this legally? Is there another way we can do this without doing it the wrong way? Uh, you know, which is which is why it's important to take action. You know, call your mm -hmm. legislator, uh, ask them questions. You know, I've sent messages to the Speaker of the House, you know, personally. I've, uh, you know, talked to anyone who I know, you know, within the presidency who is able to talk to the people. Let them take action about it. But I think the thought, which is which is really, really critical and most important, is that <laughs> eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. We cannot outsource activity to other people. Pin and co may be doing the hard work of going to court and all that, but don't outsource activism to them. Yes. They can do it, but also make sure you speak up. If the Twitter mm -hmm. ban is affecting you, document it mm -hmm. and put that information out there. Even if you want to anonymize it, for example, if you're a business person who this ban is affecting, put your story together, share it with us. We can anonymize mm -hmm. if you want to be protected, and we put that information out there. The more okay. information we have out there about some of the ways that this is affecting everyone, the more government realizes that you are losing money. They are also mm -hmm. losing money because you don't you know, pay tax revenue to them. Uh, and then it means that if we, we don't get enough tax revenue, it means education suffers. It means security suffers. Mm -hmm. It means healthcare suffers. So at the end of the day, you ban Twitter and then you end up killing people, not educating them and not making them safe. And there's a connection. You know, on this, there's a reason why human rights is good for a country. It's not only because yes. human rights is a nice thing to say. It's because the mm -hmm. cost of violations, the mm -hmm. cost of tyranny mm -hmm. is... It means that you will what you're supposed to spend on the good things of life, you're going to spend on hunting down your citizens and sending them to jail. Yes. Yes, this is this is really, really something. So so what you're saying is for so how do so how do, do citizens get involved? So when they write their stories, where do they send it to? So that so, for uh, example, you know, uh, they won't uh, feel I, like there's nothing they can do. I recommend that people should share their story. If you don't want to share on Twitter, share share on other you know platforms like Facebook, like Instagram, like YouTube. Uh, share with your friends. Share on WhatsApp. But for those who want to be anonymous, I'm saying go mm -hmm. to Twitter. You see at Paradigm HQ. Write to at Paradigm mm -hmm. HQ. Worst case scenario, send an mm -hmm. email to hello mm -hmm. at paradigmhq.org. Send us your story. Tell us why you want to anonymize, anonymize, share your story on your behalf. But I actually really want to encourage people 
not to be shy and not to be afraid and to share their stories so that there can be a real name behind the story. If the story is coming from effort, it means that we know there's a human being behind the story. If the story is coming from mm. a Nigerian, then we're like, okay, anybody could have made this up. In fact, government will believe mm. the stories are made up. So mm. I encourage people, share your story. Mm. What has it done to you? It's been 102 days now. I mean, 103 days now. Today is Wednesday. It's 103 days that the 2000 shut down uh, in Nigeria. What has happened to your business? Have you lost money? Mm. Give us the numbers. Let's not rely only on net blocks that says $250,000 is lost every hour if there's a total shutdown. Uh, thankfully, because of VPN, we don't have a total shutdown, so we're not losing exactly $50,000 mm. mm. every hour. Uh, but how much of that have you lost as a business? $10,000, 1,000 Naira, 3,000 Yen. Whatever you have lost, let us know and let this conversation continue. This is the loss on individual. Mm. This is the loss to government. Mm. This is the you know um, economic implication for Nigeria. This is the health implication. This is how many schools. If you had gained three thousand naira and you had paid mm. a tax of sixty naira to government, mm. five naira would have gone to education. That's money lost to education. Mm. That could maybe have bought water for a child as part of the government school feeding program. So we need to bring mm -hmm. all of this together so that everyone knows. It's not just about parliamentary TV in Nigeria, Middle Rights Agenda and others, and Sarah who are you know, making us about this thing. Mm -hmm. It's about your access to the platform of your mm -hmm. choice, what digital freedom is, as I said in the very beginning. And this is about next time in 2023, if you allow Buhari to get away with the Twitter ban, in 2023, APC will shut down the internet. Yeah. And there is nothing that will be done about it. So this is the time. This is the time. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. The mm, best time is now. Is now. Hmm. This, is, this is a clarion call, and this is a serious matter, because um, the fact that Twitter was shut down Facebook can be next, Instagram, and so much would be lost. It, it, it will shut down businesses, millions of businesses in, in Nigeria, and, and, and come to think of it. So it's really something that you have uh, mentioned this. So I'm going to, because you've, you've already talked about, um, you've already kind of covered um, the next question. So I'm just going to go right down to the question after that. Now you've talked about um, you've talked about uh, um, second. you've talked about digital freedom and digital rights. So, um, what are the ideal policies that need to be in place? So now, um, like you've said, there are lawsuits that have gone on right now. Is there any legislation that can impede such atrocities moving forward? Uh, yes, uh, so we already have some, and there are some that are still, you know, at the bill stage. And um, mm. we have the Freedom of Information Act, right? Mm. So we have FOI Act, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And business needs to use that more so that you can ask mm -hmm. for, you know, you can ask government institutions, for, you know, for information mm -hmm. that you need, and able to get data and things like that. So when Lai Mohammed comes online and says, mm -hmm. uh, we have done mm -hmm. X, you can write mm -hmm. to they, you know, I like mentioning mm -hmm. lie a lot because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's just what his Twitter shut down, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically cementing his legacy anyway, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. um, you can ask questions with that. Mm -hmm. But then there are other things like mm -hmm. the data protection bill, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. I mean, there are some distribution bills in the, in the National Assembly, but there is one mm -hmm. that has received more feedback mm -hmm. from state uh that is about to be present well mm -hmm. as yet mm -hmm. uh presented mm -hmm. to the national assembly uh data mm -hmm. is great right because it then establishes the office of a data protection commissioner somebody who is responsible for either when government or individuals or companies mm -hmm. or anyone violates your data privacy right right and you can uh seek redress uh, the other bill which I have spent a long time, you know, in my career on, is what is called the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill. Uh, okay. We started on a parliamentary in 2014. 
uh, it got presented as a bill uh, in the House in 2016, uh, sponsored by Honorable Jam uh, at the time from Energy. And it, uh, it, it, was, it was passed by the National Assembly in 2019, uh, sent to President Buhari and then signed it. Uh, it's now back uh, in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it will not. And, and I said to someone, I said, even if that bill goes to Buhari again, he doesn't sign it, uh, we will mm -hmm. still go back to the National Assembly. I can say this mm -hmm. categorically. After Buhari mm -hmm. is long gone, or while Buhari is here, that bill will become law. So he can decide to make history by becoming the one who gave Nigeria that law, or he can choose to ignore it. Uh, but he shouldn't worry, he will benefit from it when it becomes law also, because it's for the benefit of all citizens, including even past yes. uh, officers. And what this, what this bill does is that it takes care of things like, uh, you know, uh, rights to uh, access online, right to you know expression and freedom of association all of those you know, freedoms i've mentioned earlier they are then codified uh, and put in that bill and the reason why we have to have that, that drafted that bill is because many years ago we had a meeting with national security advisors office and you know the question was very funny like okay guys you don't want this to go back from that are you guys serious what exactly do you want uh, and so in answering that question what exactly do you want uh we went to the drawing board and we put down everything that we think Nigeria uh, needs in terms of digital rights and freedom uh, and that is what that bill uh, represents and you can name it people can get a copy of the bill on either the National Assembly website on you know, or parliamentary website or if you just google digital rights and freedom bill Nigeria uh, 20, mm -hmm. 20, 2020 uh, you'll be able to get a copy of the bill and see many of the things that it speaks about. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Um, thank you so much for, um, for that, because we need to, even we and the public needs to be aware that there are, there are bills that are out there in terms of that need to be in place to ensure our digital rights and our digital freedom, you know. Um, so guys on the platform, if you have any questions for Benga, please put it on the comment section so that after we go through the questions, um, we'll be happy to take your questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to go to the next one, and, and I think you touched on this a bit in terms of all the sectors of the economy for digital freedom. So how do all sectors work together for for digital freedom? Where do we go from here? You know, so that's, I, I, that's I think that's actually the, the, one of the most interesting bits, bits because mm -hmm. uh, it's called enlightened self-interest. Every sector mm -hmm. seeks its own interest. The private sector needs trust to hold on to customers. Customer acquisition, yes. acquisition in the digital age is built on trust. Yes. So if people don't trust that you keep their data safe, or they don't trust that when they try to go on Twitter, they will have access, it means that they won't trust you and they won't use your service. So in your own mm -hmm. interest, make sure you seek your own interest by making sure mm -hmm. that digital freedom exists. Uh, same thing mm -hmm. for government. Uh, you know, you want to vaccinate your citizens. You want them to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. and people already have vaccine hesitancy. How do you help people get vaccinated? NCDC was doing an awesome job on Twitter with coronavirus information. Then yeah. the Twitter came. And then NCDC was gone. People used to share those images every day. Once they got it from Twitter, they started sharing it on WhatsApp. I haven't seen it recently. But guess mm -hmm. what? They're actually sharing it on Facebook, but because people were engaging them more on Twitter, and then they went mm -hmm. quiet on Twitter. You know, the social, so it's in the interest of government to allow digital freedom so that they can get yeah. information to citizens. In fact, let me tell Lai Mohammed a secret that he already knows. If you want to do propaganda, the best way to do it is to keep digital freedom active. So that you can do your propaganda successfully and because right mm -hmm. now even government propaganda is not working because they're not on yes. twitter the propaganda uh they moved to coup uh the indian equivalent of twitter uh and and nobody is there with them nobody they, goes there nobody nobody goes to that you know where where nobody is so you know where do we go from here Enlighten self-interest. Citizens, seek your own interests. You want to keep learning. You want to keep shopping. You want to keep entertaining yourself online. So speak up. 
also a civil society, you need a space to work, a space to promote the work that you do. So speak up. All sectors, we have this win that we all share. And that win is that if digital freedom continues, we will all have our place, uh, our places to enjoy, uh, including even the government propagandists, so they can keep sharing propaganda, even though we won't believe them. <laughs> honest, honestly, it, it, but, but but like you said, it's it's in it's it's, it's what you call self interest, you know. Uh, um, with the with the corporate sector, they need to be able to inspire trust in customers and what have you. And it, it was even a good way for them to communicate with their customers. When a customer is disgruntled, they can just go on Twitter and then they mm -hmm. can address the complaints in real time. You know, let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you a quick joke. When we sued telecom companies, mm -hmm. somebody tweeted it, and I actually mentioned, I mentioned the uh, the telecom companies, and automatically I got a bot reply from one of the tech companies. Even though what I said was that we have sued you, they replied mm -hmm. automatically saying whatever the problem is, please send us a DM. Then every time somebody replied on that thread, they kept responding. Mm -hmm you know, bot response to, to the response. And it was very funny to see that because if they had done their own job properly and had questioned government when government came to them, then they would have spent their energy actually solving problems and not looking stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 it's really it's really something because um, um, everybody has their interest in making sure that and there's digital freedom um, in Nigeria. So, you know, it's, it's just best that we all work together and, and rally, even rally over um, some of this um, some of this legislation that, um, that you have um, going on here. So um, I think I, I, I think based on our conversation, I, I have an, an idea of what the answer to this question is based on our discussions. So like there, you've talked about various organizations like yourself that has been um, working on digital rights. Yes, we have this Twitter ban right now. Is this a wake up call for us to have moved forward or we've just regressed even further? I think it's both. Uh, I think in a way we regressed because um, it's what uh, Professor Otome calls the recursive uh, economy, where you move two steps forward, three steps backward, one step forward, step forward. So we, we regressed, no thanks to Mr. Lai Mohammed, Mr. Oshimbaju, and Mr. Buhari uh, with this silly ban. But it has also woken citizens up. I haven't seen people react like they do now in a very long time. I mean, I've been doing this work for 21 years plus, right? And it's not common to see NIDA an Indonesian of government release a draft bill or it leaks <clears throat> and people organize around it and begin to share information and say, no, we don't want, we don't want. So what has happened is that government has stepped on the tail of the tiger. It wasn't intentional. Mm. They thought they were cowards. They thought people would just roll over and say, hey, kumba, ya kumba, ya kumba. No, no, no. Mm. What has happened is that, yes, we've stepped back, but people have realized that, wait a second, these guys are up to no good. If they can do this, because... A lot of people thought that this was going to be an announcement by government and then it would be a threat and they won't do it. Uh, and some of us have said, yes. for, very, some of us said for a very long time that uh, you know, Nigeria hasn't shut down the internet. But I mean, I've been writing the report, uh, I've been writing reports on internet shutdowns for Nigeria and other African countries for, you know, since, since you know, like 2004, 2000 and, no, 2007, sorry. And, and one of the things I can tell you for a fact there are a few things. There are a few things that uh, just need to be in place for a country to begin to misbehave. One of them is a silent citizenry. When citizens are silent, governments will misbehave. It's, 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 it's almost normal. Anywhere in the world, if government tests something and people don't react, the government will misbehave. I mean, look at Donald Trump. You know, he almost got away with some things until people were like, "Okay, wait a second, we need to treat this guy's, you know, issues and things like that." Um, and and the good thing is that in Nigeria, we now have a scenario where citizens are very conscious and are not willing to roll over. That's a good thing. In fact, that is, that is a. Good thing. Uh, I think for 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 us, I think that. Um, 
you know, sit, sometimes citizens are forced to engage. They are not mm. even, now it's like a forced uh, a, a, a bit. And um, I'm going to just digress for a second. There has been a lot of oppression in protesting now, especially since what happened last year uh, with NSAS. Like, how do you think, I mean, you mentioned one about people sharing their stories, which is a very, very powerful thing, because now all you need is your cell phone, and then you can share your story, and then it goes, it goes around the world, it goes viral. So um, what, in terms of protests, can they, can they still protest without the fear of uh, repercussions, or they should just continue to, um, you know, to just speak up like for example um in a, in a do state there was a road that was badly done mm. and then a citizen used a phone camera and just started picking the road himself and then of course the government now came and responded to that is, is that an example of how citizens should should stay more engaged can they protest or do, because you know there is this this is a a, a, a discussion that we've kind of danced around and tittered around, especially when it comes to protesting. Do they just kind of say, okay, this is what would work and be more effective? Or what are your thoughts on that? So let's start by saying that on October 20, 2021, I will be on the streets of Lagos or Abuja or Ibadan. Let me not give up the location so that the civil service will do their work well. Um, I will protest. And the reason for that is because exactly one year ago on that day, military men, soldiers killed and policemen killed innocent citizens who were asking for police reform. Um, now, I'm speaking for myself. The reason why I would say this theoretically is because I don't want to be accused of, you know, saying people go on the streets and protest and I won't be there. I always show up. You know, when there were protests earlier, uh, earlier in the year, uh, I tweeted, something about a flyer that people, you know there was going to be a protest at the other time someone said mm, that's how you guys do it you send people to you know to go there and you won't show up i didn't say anything and i did a live video from the protest not to prove to anyone that i want i'm coming to protest i don't do performance mm -hmm. performance when it comes to you know mm -hmm. activism or to citizenship it is my life you know i've got two kids i've got a family i have to build a better country for them. That's why I do the things I do. That's why I protest. That's why I do the things I do. So if people feel pained enough to protest, nobody needs to tell them how to protest. Listen, when people really feel the pinch, nobody will tell them when they will meet themselves in front of the villa or in front of governor's offices across Nigeria. Nobody will tell them. Right now, I don't even know, to be honest, I don't know how many Nigerians in the bottom 30% are surviving. But because they say in quotes, we're resilient people, people still manage. I mean, things that we used to buy, you know, in my family many, you know, many, a few months ago, now we can't even find them. And, and I'm asking myself, so if I am feeling this, I can't find the product I want, or the products I want are three times or two times the price, then how are the people who maybe not don't have the privilege, you know, some of the privileges I have, how are they coping? If we feel like life is okay, let's not protest, then it's okay. If people deserve mm -hmm. a time, the kind of protests that they engage in. So if people want to protest online, by all means. If you want to protest offline, by all means. But as far as Ben Gashison is concerned, I keep protesting online mm -hmm. and offline because mm -hmm. the issues I'm dealing with are not issues that are referred to online alone. They're issues of life and death in some cases. So I think that citizens will make up their minds on what they want to do, when they want to do it. Uh, I think one of the problems we have in Nigeria is that protests are still organized. You know, we still, we announce a date, we buy pure water, we have megaphone, and then we meet. That's no longer a protest. Mm -hmm. A real protest mm -hmm. is when citizens decide Enough is enough. Auto get enough is enough. Yes, you don't. Sir. You don't now. Do. That that mm -hmm. be the mother of protest. Many people have announced mother of protest. Taliban has announced mm -hmm. it. Many people have announced our mother of protest and things like that. The real mother of protest in Nigeria is when citizens have had enough and decide why are we dying every day, 
and then they go to those who get yes. the resources to keep them alive and don't and then they ask them the question they say salaries are not being paid to doctors and to government officers how many governors have not received their salaries and when they drive around exactly the road, stay on the road and wave at them we still take pictures with them i look forward to that day when nigerians will get into a meeting the governor will arrive and they will ignore the governor and tell him get out of here go and pay salaries get out of here go and do the right thing because mm -hmm. unfortunately we just seem to want to be you know the similitude of power we want to be around power and take pictures with them and things like that you know um mm -hmm. uh, so i do not speak for what people should do when people are ready they'll do what they need to do but i think mm -hmm. we need to stop mm -hmm. you know uh outsourcing our, our protests to people i will protest mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. but when people are ready and depending on what they want they can then decide how they want to Wow, thank you so much, um, Benga. This has been such a great conversation, especially talking about digital rights and digital freedom. You know, this is a it, it, it's a huge uh, uh, issue right now um, in Nigeria and even in Africa. I mean, look at what happened in Uganda. You know, in terms of how what Twitter did for our people there, and then um, the reaction from that, and then so many. It's like the, the, the civic space, it's, it's, it's shrinking. And, and I think that uh, we, need, we all need to do something. And in addition to that, the narrative, even about civil society and the work we do in, in Nigeria and in a continent should be showcased to the public so that more people can even align with us as a platform for them to speak out. Because most advocacy organizations, well, we, we build leaders. That's what we do. Because when we have people come, we build leaders and then they're they are empowered to speak up. So it's like, okay, how, so that when we make those connections, then citizens are empowered. We would, we would even have too many people too many volunteers, too many people to even engage with because they would have that platform to be able to speak up for digital rights and for justice in general in, in Nigeria. Binga, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you, I thank you, thank your team for the great, great work you've been doing in Nigeria, all over the continent. And I'm, I'm going to be in touch with you as well because we're, we're trying to do like a civic space discussion series. It's going to be very robust in terms of talking to all various it's like it's going to be complex breakdown of various members of the civic space a lot of times they say oh the civic space is just civil society organization it's just activists it's just media practitioners it's just us but it's it's so complex and when we have those discussions hopefully we'll be able to make those connections so again Benga, thank you so much and uh, uh, I'll see you in the trenches. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Epa. Uh, all right, take care. All right. Hello, everyone, guys. You heard it from Wenga Sheson, the executive director of Paradigm Initiative. They have spread to countries all over Africa advocating for digital rights, advocating for digital freedom, and actually providing um, ICT resources for youth all over the continent because youth, they are taking over um, and the continent. So the, 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 the more ready we are for it, the better we are as a people. So guys, um, I'll see you guys next week for another substantive, wonderful episode of Dev Sector Series. Um, also, if you want to sponsor a Dev Sector Series, reach me at 234-703-539-8086. So um, I look forward to um, talking to you all um, some more about, uh, um, you know, just about connecting civil society, connecting um, the development sector to the public. So um, the more that um, we get the support to be able to do that, the better for us all. So again, um, thank you all so much. And guys, let us change the world together. Take care. Thank you for watching the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Are you interested in sponsoring Dev Sector Series? Please call me at 234-703-539-8086. As we spread your brand, 
we spread around the world. And as we do that, we are all changing the world. So let's work together. Contact me so that we can maximize social impact. I look forward to hearing from you. Then, you know, the environment was cleaned up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. And then with Social Impact Consulting, 